a generous heart. Besides being one of our greatest writers himself, for well over half a century, John Guare has championed, mentored, arranged stipends, served on grant, com grant committees, steered funding, read copiously, networked, enthused, encouraged, and promoted the work of other playwrights. Here's, here's from a <clears throat> tribute John wrote to Edward Albee. It was on the occasion of the London premiere of Three Tall Women. This is John, and I can't do his voice, but God knows I would love to. <laughs> and I got his bow tie. You can't imagine the debt that every American playwright writing after 1960 owes to Edward Albee. September 28th, 1959, was the world premiere of Zoo Story, which for the most arcane of reasons was opening in Berlin, in Germany, on a double bill with Beckett's Crap's Last Tape. The 30-year-old playwright traveled from New York for his opening night, even though he spoke no German. This was his first play, and he'd never seen anything of his done because he'd never written anything before. He sat in the Berlin balcony, and he found himself not looking at the stage, but rather watching the audience's reaction. He knew he was a playwright because his concern was not so much his words as the effect his words were having on the audience. Even though those words were in another language, he understood the silences, he understood the shock, and he understood the bravos. In 1960, on Broadway, not a lot was permitted. There was a very small off, 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 there was a very small off-Broadway movement that did very few new plays. The theater I wanted to write for was in France, in England, Beckett, Ionesco, Osborne, Brecht. When I saw Durenmatz, The Visit, and learned he was Swiss, I thought my only chance was to move to Switzerland. <laughs> but then, in 1960, the Berlin double bill of Beckett and Albee opened in English in New York at the Provincetown Playhouse, where a number of Eugene O'Neill's plays had been seen. I came up from my university in Washington, D.C. to see the Beckett Albee plays, which had opened triumphantly. And the production ended, and I was in a daze. I was lost, but I was home. I was at sea. But I was not drowning. The future had finally shown up. Whatever theatrical revolution had started in England and France had finally hit America. I walked around the village for hours in a fever, afraid to let go of that spell. Holy Christ, maybe I could be a playwright. What if maybe I returned to my parents' house that night in New York. I had to tell the story of what I had seen that night to someone. I couldn't let go of the future. I wanted to make sure that, that what I had seen stayed in my bones. So in my fever, without telling them what, was, what they were hearing, I woke them up and I began acting out zoo story. <laughs> my old parents sat in their pajamas on the edge of their bed bleary-eyed with sleep and horrified and spellbound, <laughs> not sure if what I was telling them had actually happened. Had I stabbed someone in Central Park? <laughs> or had, had someone else been stabbed in Central Park? What parents of playwrights go through. <laughs> but what amazed me was how the retelling of Albee's story held European Beckett was another world, but American 
all be, I could grasp. And obviously a generation of playwrights felt the same way. We all wrote our own version of Zoot's zoo story. All be spawned an entire generation of park bench plays. Theaters for years began, became littered with park benches. <laughs> and to show you were avant-garde, you needed no more than a dark room and a park bench. <laughs> In 1962, he wrote Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, which previewed and opened right on Broadway, for, for going the traditional out-of-town tryout, which was a remarkably novel idea at the time. And it was at this time that Edward Albee did something that made him a saint in the canon of playwrights for all time. Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf was perhaps the last blockbuster international success with its one set, four actors. It seemed to pay back its investors every few days. <laughs> and what did Albee and his producers do with their money? They put their money into the future. They leased a theater in the lower reaches of Greenwich Village on Van Damme Street. And from 1963 to 1969, for six months of the year, every week, produced a new play by a new playwright. A movement called Off Off Broadway was beginning. You'd stop by the Bar Wilder Albee workshop to see what was on this week to argue its merits, its flaws, how to fix it, how to protect it, how to drink in just this fabulous sense of the new. Who was in the play, who directed the play, not as important as the fact that what you were seeing was a new play written by a new American playwright. A whole generation of American playwrights, including this one, had their first work done here and became part of a theatrical movement that would spread over the world. A world in which new playwrights could function and develop with the near sacred trust that language could joyously carry the truth's wriggling burden. The entire off-off Broadway movement, which has become the mainstream of today, can trace its roots back to Albee's generosity in the 60s. It takes one to know one, John. He concludes his tribute by saying the following, but we're all here tonight because we know that his words about Albee could be written about John Guare himself. In these times when writers move back and forth promiscuously between films and TV and hopefully the stage, he maintains an exquisite fidelity to the theater. He believes an audience still exists in this eye-drenched era of visual style to match his belief that the text of the play is at the heart of the theater. The eye can be seduced, but the ear hears the truth. <laughs>